mute. Just checking we're unmuted. Presumably we are. Anyway, uh, welcome to. Uh, oh, we're there. Yeah, sorry. Just uh, fiddling with the technology as always. Uh, welcome to our live stream and uh, good to see you all. Uh, I can see that you have gotten the chat going. Uh, Team Open Clock Club is not with us uh, at the moment. They will or may be joining us. I don't know. Uh, so I'm going to be keeping a bit of an eye on the chat. So it's nice to see you getting started there. Chichester, East Devon, Cardiff, and Hazelmere, and um, Beaudley. So uh, welcome, everybody. So we are still not convinced. Oh, yeah, there's some coming out. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Clocks are easier than computers. So uh, we've had a busy horological week. It doesn't seem like uh, two minutes since, in fact, we were here last. Um, still no tidying up taking place or putting tools back in drawers from uh, being out on the road a bit again earlier this week, but that all went well, so that was good. And you may have seen my short videos on Twitter and LinkedIn. and. Um, what else has been happening clockwise? Uh, usual uh, Facebook um, activity going on. So great to see people there doing those cool repairs, uh, the drilling of the Verge Arbor and rehauling a mainspring and sheds being built left, right and center, workshops or studios, as we call them in the conservation world. And over the next couple of weeks, everything crossed, you will see finally some improvement in our uh, technology at this end. So we've got um, hopefully a new microphone set up on the way and also a rig for our cameras so we can get away from all this wobbling stuff eventually. But that's going to be another 10 days or something coming online. Right. OK, Ah, we've been joined by uh, Team Open Clock Club now, so <laughs> we'll be able to contribute to the chat. So our spring. Let's get back to our spring. Uh, if you were here last week, you will remember that um, we kind of copied the spring that was there. The spring was broken, uh, strike inside, uh, ratchet click spring. Um, obviously, that's one of those components where all, all these treatments are kind of cost benefit exercises and risk analysis. And anything that involves safety of the object or the person that's winding it or the general public which obviously with long case clock weights and uh, presumably if you repair turret clocks, even more so with turret clock weights, you do not want those things uh, uh, breaking loose. Not that that really massively influenced the, uh, the decision uh, thought process here because the uh, original or existing spring, if I can find it, um, There it is. Here it is. We can see that. Hard, come on, focus. Broken in a way that if we were to reinforce that with some more material, then that's not going to really work as a spring anymore. Um, so I thought um, about how we might keep it. But uh, in the end, we decided to make a new one. And also making a new one, of course, is a great exercise. And this is broadly a kind of um, knowledge exchange or sort of informal teaching environment. So it's quite cool to do these things anyway. So we took a bit of CZ108 and we used CZ108 as opposed to CZ120 or CZ121 because it's really good for cold working and making springs. You can work hard on it well and it tends not to crack. Uh, unlike those leaded brasses, particularly the 121, which I think is 2% lead, is it? I don't know, I can't remember. Um, which is great for free cutting when you're machining on an automatic lathe or something, but it's not good for making the spring. 
Um, and you can see that in the color of this compound, it's quite yellow, uh, which is um, also sort of quite nice as well. It looks too new, well, it is new. Well, it's new, but, you know. Uh, uh, this is, oh, we were, that's right. I remember we were going to stamp it, weren't we, on the back with the initials. I'll see if I can find my punches because I haven't actually found them out. Yeah, I'm perfectly cool with all this. Um, you know, if, if the, some people would use what they call authentic materials or the original materials, which of course, without playing devil's advocate too much, they're neither original nor authentic, but I get the point that um, there's sometimes an effort to kind of meld things in, you know, and I've done it and sometimes I would do it with uh, sort of patinating uh, fluid or something. And we, we could do that. I don't see personally what it would add here. I'm quite cool about um, it looking different and I don't mind different materials. In fact, in another life, I'd really like to be using CAD uh, drawing and 3D printing and things. In fact, I think somebody mentioned 3D printing on this uh, live stream. So the thing is really overtly uh, different. But yeah, we could, um, we've got some patinating fluid somewhere here. And I did repair a clock a couple of weeks ago that had a new screw in the dial. And I did use that patinating fluid there just to kind of stop your eye from being attracted to it as much as um, anything else. But of course, then there's a fine line between fakery and um, and uh, forgery and that kind of thing. If you are um, particularly good at that that kind of thing. Um, anyway, so yeah, it does. It stands out like a phone, But you know, over the next what two hundred years, it'll tone down nicely, I think. Uh, and anyway, hopefully, somebody will see it and say, "Who did that? Um, it needs replacing." So the thing that I haven't bent the end over yet, so it looks worse than it is. But the thing was concerning me was that as we followed the uh, pretty much the profile of the earlier spring, of course, it extends into the dedendum or the dedenda. Um, and it concerned me that it would touch on the pinion of the pinwheel. So oh, I've taken it apart now. But anyway, that's what I was doing then. I was just checking that uh, in fact, it's quite a long way off, so that doesn't uh, bother me. But again, it, without going back over old ground, it leads me back to that thing about do you improve, you know, a design when you're making a new, new component for an old thing and um, where you don't have any real evidence that this stuff hasn't been like that always. And as a principle, I don't, because if I get into that, I'd rather do new making. Um, Again, I suppose if it was dangerous or uh, likely to cause more damage to more components. And this is the kind of issue with the spring rehauling exercise is that I do get why you would want to cut the spring off and make a new hole, but that's in conflict with keeping as much earlier material as possible. So yeah, there could be that catastrophic thing where the thing breaks through but it might not happen as well. And I tend to find, and this is maybe unfair, that of course people want to intervene because it's good fun. We all love our tools and making new things and polishing things up or whatever it is. And I totally get that. But my answer to that is if you really, really want to intervene and do um, a lot, then make new clocks. And that is a really cool exercise because when you make new clocks, you learn a lot about old ones along the way. And I think I've said this many times before, that's why uh, when we were teaching at the college, um, at West Dean College, we actually developed from a kind of escapement exercise, making your full clock, hands, dial, wheels, designing it, pendulum, every single part of it, because it's a really, really cool exercise in kind of um, aligning yourself uh, a little bit with, um, earlier makers. Anyway, um, the answer is that uh, the, the great wheel arbor back bearing is a bit warm. We checked the depth thing before. Yeah, it maybe could be improved by, uh, by bushing, um, but it's not necessary yet. I don't think we'll see when we come to test it, won't we? Uh, but this is actually fine. In fact, it's going to drop down a little bit um, when we uh, bend the end of which is what we're going to do in a minute. Um, 
So the punches, so I don't forget. I'll get them out to remind me there they are. And um, yeah, that's um, if you do, uh, if you are in um, a situation where you need to bush or rebush, well, bush in particular, um, these barrel lava bearings, and it's like really, really rare that you do particularly on those clocks where the bearing is swaged, you know, where there's been a steel drift driven in, those bearings are incredibly hard. And um, what I would, uh, pointy stick, what I would suggest is that, um, you know, normally, obviously you or I, uh, you know, wouldn't push without depth thing, but let's say, so this is our bearing here, and this is the pinwheel uh, hole. If that center distance has increased to the degree that the depth thing has deteriorated and the clock doesn't run or it's causing a problem, then yeah, you have to do something about that center distance. Um, now with great wheels, they always wear downwards. The reaction of driving uh, the pinwheel in this case uh, isn't that massive and I can't, quite figure out so the let's just have a look at this so it's driving anti-clockwise counterclockwise as we're looking at it so it's going this direction so it'll be pushing the pinwheel pinion which is that way around in that somewhere there's the tangent to the uh, the boss so it's going to be pushing the pinwheel pinion somewhere in this direction. So the hole's going to wear overlies that way. And the reaction to that, of course, is pushing this in the other direction, so somewhere across here. But that force is small compared to the gravity of the weights. So these holes always wear downwards. So what I would say, and I've never done it, but I've seen it um, on old repairs, and I think it's really cool. If you have to rebush these holes, then don't open up the hole and put a sleeve in like you would do with everything else, but actually cut, well, I mean, what do you think? Um, have you done it? Uh, and what do you think to this proposal? So what I would do is cut a dovetail in here and uh, let a bit of um, hammer hardened cast brass in. And then you're only uh, changing material that's worn away, if you like. Uh, and what you do is you preserve the rest of the hole, uh, which is really cool, particularly if you've got those swage tolls um, in our um, long overdue bushing and depth in chapter, we show a picture of that. And it's really cool when you see those. I think some people sometimes think that they're kind of a mistake or something, but it's that the hole's been hardened by the maker. Sometimes they're finished on both sides of the plate, so you never see it. Sometimes they're only finished on the inside and left on the outside, and that's really nice to see. So just some thoughts there about the uh, rebushing the Great Wheel Lab, but only bush at the bottom. In a weight-driven clock, of course, in a busy clock, you've got a different uh, different thing. So we'll come back to that later. On, on the issue of new parts. Yeah. Uh, Neil, Neil, so you like the honesty of not obviously new parts, because it adds to the story of the clock. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're talking the other... Um, Day. was it with icon i can't remember um no about ceramics and um we were talking about um oh, glass, repair. glass repair that was it uh we were talking about glass repair and where there's a break or a chip do you try and hide that or do you actually make a feature of it uh, there's um a japanese technique where the repairs are filled with uh, lacquer. And when the lacquer is still wet or sticky, um, gold uh, powder is applied. Uh, so you can actually see the repair and it makes it into an art thing or a thing of beauty and so on. And of course the world goes in cycles with all this stuff. And um, as always, there is no wrong or right, um, uh, kind of um, no wrong or right sort of uh, answer to this you know to these things but i think as always the answer is to have as many options as possible and say i could do this i could do this i could do this so in this case we could make it out of material i mean i think that this brass is the right tool for the job in the sense of it does the job 
um, we can leave it like this. I'm going to stamp it on the inside just as a point of principle, I suppose, if I can uh, see. And or you could you could patinate it to kind of tone it down a little bit. Uh, maybe we'll get the patinating fluid out and do some of it just to kind of demonstrate it. But uh, it's nice to have options. And I think, you know, for me, the thing that is of interest is dialogue, really. So uh, the spring is um, a little bit too long. And, and the earlier one, there it is, look, as you can see, had the end kicked around like that. This has been shortened. Um, so I'm going to going to do that. As I said last week, I think well, sometimes you see people have sewn a slot in the back of the click here to prevent the spring from wandering, uh, wandering off. So I'm just going to have a look through an eyeglass, mark it, and uh, then bend it around and hope it doesn't break off. If it breaks off, I'll have to start again, but maybe not uh, subject to you lot to that torture. Oh yeah, something's happened to it. Um, yeah, um, you're right, you're right, Derek. Something's happened here. I think what's happened is somebody thought it was worn. Uh, you know, whatever. I doubt very much whether they checked that, but maybe they did. We don't know. And I think what they've done is they've put a, the peen of a ball peen hammer on there and then hit that with another hammer to kind of close up the hole or something can't imagine it did any good but unfortunately you know what's done is done and can't be undone because the only way of getting around this it doesn't bother me it's just one of those slightly unfortunate things would be to sort of remove material here and um and make and plug the hole or something and then drill a new hole which would just be a whole lot more change or damage on top so i mean it's not unsightly What's it like on the inside? And I think importantly, although it's grubby uh, a little bit, let's just have another look. Yeah, I mean, it looks okay. It's not super neat again. Um, I think we have checked that thing here, haven't we? I love the fact that you lot are all picking up on these uh, things. When we get our new camera in a couple of weeks' time, then be able to see even more detail, making a rug for my own back. So what do we look for then? We see something like this, we think, haha, something's happened. Quite right uh, for pointing it out. Um, something's happened. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that somebody's been there. We could conjecture that they did, as I said, and hit it with a ball pain hammer. They may or may not have done that. It could have been there since it was new. We don't know. I doubt it. But so have we got, you know, we, we're broadly interested in this clock running, um, although it seems so long ago since we decided that maybe the world's moved on its axis. So uh, what's gonna make it, I'll stop it from running, side shake, end shake, depth thing. So end shake, good, about half millimeter, and it falls readily, there's no oil in it, from one phase to check it the way up. So it's got the magic um, rattle that we need, uh, as you can see. Got a bit of um, side shake, it's not too bad. And on the back, yeah, it's a little bit tighter. So I presume that's what somebody's done. They've seen the pivot bobbling in the hole and they haven't read our chapter on depthing and bushing, which is a bit remiss of them considering it hasn't even been published yet. Um, because if they had, that they would know that seeing the pivot bobbling about in the hole is pretty meaningless, really. It's an indication. Uh, so then, so we've got side shake, we've got end shake. Um, the next thing is, uh, I know we've been through the depth thing, so I won't repeat that whole thing, but it's the, um, is it Derek that doesn't like the, the seasick making uh, center arbor? This is at the great wheel arbor world. No, last week, somebody said it was uh, making them feel seasick. Um, yeah, it does. It's, I, I mean, this is just something that you kind of, I have to get, well, I, not you don't have to do anything, get your head around because of course the thing is that what we think looks good or bad, totally get that, everybody, we've all got our place. And um, the, the problem for me with that is you do something and you improve it and then or you change it and you think it looks better. And then there's another thing and another thing. 
So I tend to push back against all that. However, yeah, if uh, we had no end check or no side check or our depth thing was um, totally uh, up the pan. So remember, uh, just for people who weren't here last week, check our depth thing. We're going to check it at the uh, greatest centre distance in the frame, the smallest centre distance in the frame, and kind of a neutral position and see if there's any noticeable difference between those three positions. Um, if there is, and the improvement is in the position where they're pushed together, then yeah, uh, that's an indication that we might need to bush. Um, and bearing in mind that these, I've got pretty cops there. I've got two. Gosh, double, double good luck. Um, an indication that bushing might need to be carried out. So this, just check it going the right way, yeah. So with them pushed apart, I can see the center wheel's actually bent as well, isn't it? It's not flat on its collet. It. It's not smooth. It's actually fractionally, fractionally, fractionally smoother, closer together. And, um, oh yeah, so not only is the center arbor bent, but the center wheel is bent on its pinion, uh, which probably isn't a problem. Has it been dished? Mm. Might have been a bit to run on a new part of the third wheel. We can try straightening that up. So uh, let's just say, for sake of argument, end check's fine, side check's fine, depth thing seems okay. We'll see how it runs. Um, just looking at this, I wonder whether the frame has been lacquered at some point. But nice if it has, anyway. So, yeah, uh, get the point. It is um, unsightly. Scratched it. Particularly from the from the outside, um, yeah. I think that's what's happened. Somebody's taking a ball pin hammer, bigger version of that, then hit this on here. To, uh, you would think that would make the hole bigger, wouldn't you? Um, maybe, maybe not. Right. Okay. Yeah. Which pinion wire? Which pinion wire have been used in this period? Uh, yeah, I think pinion wire, I mean, I, um, I, I, I don't think so, Sam. I mean, pinion wire has been available. I've, we, again, at the college, we had a great stack of it. Nobody ever used it, something left over. But I've got a feeling, could be totally wrong here, because I'm no historian, as you know, that um, it's always been one of those nice ideas. And maybe um, uh, 20th century clocks were made with pinion wire. But no, these... Uh, you can't see on, on this, but the um, uh, you can often see where the cutter is finished. Um, as you know or not, making pinions is like a thousand times harder than making a wheel. Um, so the very, very last thing you want to do in this kind of clock making is to cut more pinion than you have to do. If any of you have milled a pinion, you, you know, when you start making, you make a wheel out of CZ120 or something, you think, wow, this is dead easy. I'm going to knock a clock out in 25 minutes. And then you start milling the pinions and the world comes tumbling down because it's just such a lot more difficult. So, no, I think, I mean, mill, uh, pinion wire is an industrial um, uh, um, product. And I, I think, was it again in Daniels, does he talk about pinion wire and breaking off the leaves and things? I've never seen it done. I've never seen any evidence of any arbors from uh, which pinion wire was made. I've got a feeling it was probably something for uh, repairers um, and the kind of 20th century repair culture thing, I think. But again, if anybody knows different, then uh, please let us know. It's cool if you can pick some up. Um, but again, from a repair situation, the chance of you finding the right pinion, the leaf number, and the module, this is the problem, of course, is finding the right module or uh, diametrical pitch, as it would have been called then, called then is uh, like, uh, not likely, not likely. When you get making, you soon build up those Thornton cutters, if you use Thornton cutters. And um, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a big range there. So don't, I know these are not, um, but maybe there are clocks out there that were made from pinion wire. Um, I, I wonder if it was drawn, maybe it was, as opposed to milled, which would make more sense from a kind of industrial process, I suppose. 
Right, uh, our spring. So let's just mark it. Now I'm going to um, be hypocritical here, as always, and use a Sharpie pen. Um, but it's on my new work. I don't try and use these on old stuff, although I think with the um, Rogue Tooth on the other uh, channel, uh, on the Saturday channel, is probably going to have to use a little bit of Sharpie pen. But as a principle, talking about things looking old on you, I don't use Sharpie pen. I wouldn't recommend it because it does leave a mark. Sometimes it can actually kind of bite into the tarnish or patina, which, of course, if you're getting rid of that anyway, it probably doesn't matter. But as you know, that's not where I'm at. So just take the old slip washer off. Yeah, really poor answer, but... You thought it may relate to early industrialisation. No, I, I don't think so, um, unless it was drawn, but I've never seen any evidence of any people actually using it to make a clock uh, like this. I mean, definitely um, kind of standardised parts, absolutely, no question, all these clocks and uh, earlier stuff as well. Um, things like castings, it's, it's kind of broadly interesting that, um, you know, what was easy, what is easy now uh, was easy before and the, the other way around in some cases. So those uh, sort of clocks in the 1660s, 1670s are often made from castings. So if we were to, um, you know, think today about making a pattern, then getting a casting and stuff, we'd go, oh, you know, that's a big job. Um, we'd just machine it from the solid. But to the uh, 17th century clockmaker, we're getting a pattern made, presumably if you lived in an urban area or maybe you did it yourself, I don't know, getting a pattern made, getting a casting was obviously relatively simple. I noticed as well on those earlier clocks that they really avoided, if they could, drilling through small holes. You know, when you drill through a hole uh, in a plate of brass, for instance, it often breaks when it exits the work, when the brass gets really thin. And uh, so I've noticed that um, a lot of, not a lot, but sometimes those holes are drilled blind to avoid that problem. So presumably that, you know, today you just go buy a new drill bit. Um, so yeah, it's interesting how things change. Don't know about the opinion wire. Might be worth looking at West Dean Library and seeing if anybody's ever done a, a dissertation on it. And I don't know, Sam, I know Jared, uh, Jeremy's down that neck of the woods and Chris as well they uh, Chris in particular maybe because I know he's with the HS uh, Westin had a big stack opinion why it would be cool to get some and look at how it was made and um, uh, and how it was used and things maybe there's something published in antiquarian horology again uh, join the AHS because they've got an amazing searchable digital uh, archive right okay so just going to look where the um, earliest spring came to. Lost my new best friend, the parallel pliers. There's, um, again, without banging on so much about cleaning, because we haven't refinished this clock uh, yet. Um, there's witness marks uh, where, um, you know, components have been. So I can see where that spring was before it was shortened or before it broke, which gives us an indication at least of where we think the, uh, the new one should be bent to. Obviously, I've got a, a one hit opportunity here to get this um, get this right. Um, yeah, with any spring like this, it wants to be as long as possible. So as reasonably close to the pivot point as you can get it. Then particularly like this, where we talked a couple of weeks ago about the sort of axis of the spring actually being the wrong way around, uh, sort of like, you know, not amazing design. Um, you want the, the, the spring to touch 
right up near the pivot if you can. Obviously, if it touches actually at the pivot, it ain't going to work at all. So there's a kind of sweet spot there. And we can actually, without putting off, actually bending in it, snapping off live on air. Um, we can actually just have a little play about with that. Ooh. So if we just we can find where that sweet spot is. Yeah, see, once you get up to the radius of the pivot, um, or in this case, somewhere about the radius of the pivot, it becomes quite indistinct. And if you just move a little bit away from that, It's kind of a point where it's just sort of, uh, without sounding too romantic, quite lively. And of course, we can look on the click and see where it's been rubbing before. So about there. So I'm just going to check that with my mark. Like this. It's a beautiful evening here in York, so thank you for joining us if it's a beautiful evening where you are. Um, appreciate that. Yeah, again, I don't know whether you can see, but there's actually quite a distinct, see if I can get it in the light. Can you see that? Yeah, you can just see it there, look. Uh, there's actually quite a distinct wear mark. So I'm gonna try and hit that so it's a little bit longer than my um, my original mark was. Which means that in fact, only um, a couple of mil at the end if that needs bending round. Yeah, it's about half the value I marked on there. So that's quite interesting. So again, more um, evidence if we needed it uh, to um, don't refinish things because you lose a lot of these marks, like these lovely, not that they're of any use to us, but these lovely marks on the inside of the plate, which are of use maybe. Right, okay. So we're going to just um, bend it around there. I might use my new pliers and then I'll just hammer it down on a um, cut C and bend it at the same time, I'm afraid. So, um, it would be a good idea if I bent it the right way as well, wouldn't it? It'd be moderately embarrassing to bend it the wrong way and it snap off. Again, it never stopped me before. All right. There we go. So um, we could leave it just like that, but I'm actually going to hammer it down in the block just to kind of smarten it up a bit because it looks a bit squidgy as it is. So let's just get the uh, And that's half the reason why we use the CZ108 because um, it doesn't break. Oh, it's less likely to break off anyway. So let's just tidy that up. There we go. Um, so now I'm just going to, again, it's still squidgy on the back. Uh, I don't like squidgy that much. So this is where I'm going to, um, what do they say? Great is the enemy of good. Uh, file it on the corner, file off the corner. You often see this on this kind of work. And um, just to smarten up that sort of radius on the back. Um, 
and again it's new work so you might say well, what you're doing that for matthew we don't want smart necessarily we just need functional which is true so got a nice little four inch um pillar file or hand file and So just put a little bevel on there. You can see that. And then just gonna, again, tidy the end, tidy that face. Without filing through too much so it actually breaks off. And then the kind of moment of truth. I'm not gonna rivet it on today because I want to do the next phase of the cleaning might as well you know normally it's riveted on so you can't get that stuff from underneath it uh so let's just pin it on and that's again uh, without um going over all ground again that was the beauty of fitting it like this you can see that we've had to fit take it off put it on and the great thing about these really nice uh nice these tight pins is that you can uh do that many times it's squidgy, 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 yeah, yeah, I don't like squidgy, um, which is, uh, don't get me started, Derek, about abrasive paper. I'll, w I'll wait until after seven o'clock, the watershed, then I'll start talking about squidginess of uh, using wet and dry paper. Right. Is it going to work? No oil on it yet. There we are. Good. It'll sound a little bit sharper when it's um, when it's cleaned up and it's got a bit of oil on it. And of course, as always, what you want to do when we finally rivet it on, we want to check that it's actually free of the great wheel, face of the great wheel or the plate, if we're riveting it onto a, a plate, because otherwise it's just going to rub. Big uh, issue that you see the whole time on repairs of hammer springs on the inside back plate is it of a long case clock and you hear that squeak uh and the springs rubbing on the on the plate but anyway that doesn't bother us at the moment uh we are okay there with the dedenda dedendum so good so uh i'll just get my stamps out and try and stamp it <laughs> could all go wrong there so a little kind of summary of that whole thing I'm leaving it this colour. Anybody can come along in the future and see that it's new or later or whatever and make a decision about it. So I think the only, we had a bit of a struggle getting those rivets out, but it didn't get too mutilated. The only thing I wasn't particularly happy about was the fact that the inside of the click has obviously got a burr on it or something and it scratched the face of the wheel there. So we've got a little scratch mark, which isn't brilliant. But um, other than that, I'm... As, as confident as you can be that that's going to give uh, safe service and um, so good. So slightly uh, happy about that. So we'll take it off and we will stamp it. Yeah, all good. I'm not going to bother with the end actually. I'm just going to leave it like that anyway. Right. So... On to the next thing. So I think the next thing we'll try and do after we've stamped this is um, straighten the uh, seasick centre arbour. And then maybe, I'm not sure I'm really uh, kitted up for doing the repivoting. I'll think about that, see how we could go on with work holding. Um, probably one of those situations where we need a bigger lathe. So that might have to wait, but uh, we can talk about that anyway. Um, let's get rid of all this and that out the way, block, so that's the back, uh, let's get our punches, you can actually get a punch, it's quite nice if you do a lot of making or a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of making new parts for old clocks, if you go to, um, 
prior punches, um, they unfortunately weren't in order. You can get your own punch made, tiny little kind of hallmark uh, punch or something called a trace tool, uh, which is a um, similar kind of thing. Yeah. So these are uh, you can see there one mil sixteenth of an inch, um, as if sixteenth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch isn't one mil, is it? No. <laughs> what's uh, what's sixteenth of an inch? Um, you anyway? What's sixteenth of an inch? Twenty five point four divided by sixteen. It's not even I know it's not one. <laughs> Anyhow, so you can get, um, I'll just check this is the right way up. I think it's, otherwise it'll be W. Yeah. You can get uh, holders for these punches if you want to do it more neatly. Or as I said, you can get this trace tool thing. And I remember now there's one that you can roll on. So you have your whole name or company mark or whatever it is. And you just kind of go like that and it rolls it on, which is quite good. And let's just look for some letters, numbers, I mean, even. 1.5 mil. So they were being a bit. Uh, Oh, does that say 1.6? Is that meant to say 1.6? I thought it said 1.0. That would make more sense, wouldn't it? Uh, have they rounded it up to 1.6? Probably, yeah. All right, okay. So that's, yeah. Sorry. Apologise to whoever made these punches. Uh, it says 1.6, not 1. Um, so, yeah, prior punches, uh, super top quality, and you can get your own one made. And it's not that expensive. It used to be about 95 quid or something like an assay punch, and then uh, you can mark all your parts. So let's just dig out some numbers. Yeah, they've had them. Um... <laughs> all right, that's interesting. I like things like this, sorry. Uh, everything, I like anything that's a distraction, as you can guess. Um, it, it said 1.5, and somebody's gone over the top with a zero. Uh, there you go. So, what day is it? Anybody got an idea? 28th, is it? 29th. All right, cheapskates, so they haven't put a nine in. So we'll have to use a six upside down. So there's a whole lot of um, converse, uh, conversation in conservation about date. Um, you know, the, this thing about scratching your name on things, uh, on watches and stuff. As um, Seth said in, he, in the Icon event, uh, did I say our new Icon event is up online if you want to book in for that? Did I say that already? No. Oh, it is. Anyway, go to the Icon webpage. We've got Fyodor Vandenbroek from uh, the Royal Collection. We've got Daniel Carter from uh, Royal Greenwich Museums talking about Arduino. We've got uh, Dale Sardison talking about a fire damage clock. And we've got Uncle Ken who couldn't join us last time because his technology let him down. And we're going to try and get all the panel back together so we can have some kind of continuity in the, uh, in the chat. That's right. Twenty nine. 
Oh, this is taking every single bit of concentration I've got, by the way. Sound, put the wrong year. And yes, somebody can come along with a file and scrub it off. If it was um, in the dark and distant past when I used to do virtual conversions, when I put the mark on, you can really kind of punch it under the, you know, the potencies and things. But on this, of course, it's quite thin. So there we go. Ta-da! Might have to just file off on the back because it's probably... Um, Made it a bit lumpy. Oh, there we are. All done. Marked up. Probably the only time or well, the first time that's been done uh, on television. We can call it the television. So you saw it here first. Yeah, please, please uh, sign up for the icon event. It'll be good fun. Um, we've changed the format a little bit to um, to uh, a way to a webinar from a meeting because we were oversubscribed several times last time, which annoyed a few people I think but um there you go so it's a webinar so I've got 500 places so please go to the icon website and sign up it's free to attend whether you are a member or not okay was that a question you mean the, graf the graffiti from old uh yeah I Pete Peter is it yeah, Peter, do you mean the marks are put there by repairers, the kind of scratched marks? Uh, if you do, then yeah, we discussed this in the ICON meeting. It's now that video is now online, so you can find it. Um, we'll try and remember to put a link to that from uh, this, this meeting. And um, the answer is they can be, of course, incredibly useful, particularly if they're um, like somebody scratched something meaningful, but I don't do it and the world of conservation doesn't do it uh, and hopefully nobody else does it anymore um, because you just uh, end up building that up. TBH, it's not the worst thing in the world because if you think about scratching your name on a thing compared to, for instance, uh, refinishing chemically or mechanically or ultrasonic or something where you actually refinish the whole thing, you could argue, I suppose, that the scratch is a tiny percentage of the surface area of the object and doesn't actually affect its integrity uh, or what it means. Well, it does affect what it means because everything affects everything. Um, so, yeah, is that, is that what you meant? I mean, the answer is they're fascinating for researchers, but I don't mark uh, old things if I can. I mean, just by working on an object, taking it apart, putting it together, however careful you are, you change that thing. You know, you change it by thinking about it and discussing it, but certainly handling, cleaning, washing, putting back together, all these little scratches and marks, for me, that's enough as it is. So I don't want to do uh, any more. Right. Um, just need to find some pins, which might be a challenge. <laughs> Just knock a couple of pins in. So I'm just going to bend this um, when it's in the frame. Again, maybe there's a better way of holding it. Uh, it'd be kind of quite nice to put it in a not quite sure how that would work actually. You could put it up between centers, I suppose. 
uh, in a bigger lathe and bend it down so you can actually see it being central. Uh, now this, whether we're not going to get it dead uh, straight, but I don't particularly mind about that. So what this is going to do, of course, is it's going to change the um, angle of the minute hand in relation to the plane of the dial if it's bent. And that will then change when you set, because the cannon wheel um, is in a, uh, the it's not in a fixed relationship with this center. So when you set the hands on the clock, then if the hand was up at one side at one time at say three o'clock, it's gonna be in a different position. So we need to get it something like, and um, we also need to get the cannon wheel on as well. In fact, that's a good point, it says, that I've made. Do we want to straighten it with the cannon wheel on? Because when you look at it, it's basically nice and straight here, and then it's bent in one place. Uh, so just drop all these pins. Gritty cobs everywhere. Um, so is that going to help us keep it straight? I suppose it's going to give it some support, isn't it? Although I can see that the, the, cannon, <laughs> the cannon pipe is also bent. Oh, dear, 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 dear. Right, OK. I hadn't noticed that before. Um, looks very sad, doesn't it? Poor thing. Anyway. Um, Mm. So uh, how the um, team open clock clubs just disappeared for a few minutes. In fact, I think they have to abandon ship and go to another event. Now we're unlocking a little bit. So let's just get this. Let's just have a look at this first independently. Right. OK, so that is quite bent. I don't think um straightening them up together is going to be the answer i because that was obviously when it did get bent was pushed right on which is um not like that now oh, well maybe um right i can't see the live chat uh going to take a short break from the chat matthew's carrying on without a break superstar going Hollow punch that fits over the abba. Yeah, what I've got is um, my trusty drumsticks, which I'm going to have to drill out a bit more. I had um, I had drilled this one stepped. I stepped it inside so it fits really well, and you can see there we can bend that back. And now I'm thinking, of course as they were obviously bent together this has kind of got um an s-shaped sort of double step in it so it's not looking particularly good is it right okay yeah i might actually um sort of bend it here i might go for that actually and drill this one out um so it and bend both back at once and then at least we won't have that problem of the two things trying to match up i'm just looking at the live chat seeing if whether um anybody's saying no don't know that so yeah i think uh let's just see how that goes so i need to get a drill I need to measure it first get a drill and then fit something over you could also fit something like a in this plane and sort of bend it like that. But I'm kind of quite keen on the idea of doing it, doing it like this. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, let's just measure up. Measure up.
let's call it um, 5.7 mil for sake of argument. And then this down here, although it don't, it hasn't bent here, has it? It's only bent somewhere around here-ish. So we're going to be relying a bit on material memory here. Um, 5.7. Just have a look. I won't show you inside this drill box because it's so grim. Anyway, we've got a 5.7, so drill that out, not in the middle. Oh, that one. This is my uh, punch for punching on the um, Enfield center thing. So I might stick with this. Mm. No, I'll, the infield. Um, we de demonstrated the infield punchy thing on Saturday, so it's um, it's lived a good life, and it had a good life before as uh, as a drumstick. So you can't have everything, can you? Right. Okay. Mm, it's quite meaty. Slightly difficult to imagine under what circumstances the uh, the thing got bent in the first place. Presumably, they're just kind of slightly worried about that back pivot as well of the of the arbor. I don't want to break that off. Hmm. Bit better. It's interesting. I uh, presumably what happened was when it, let's say, the clock fell over or fell off or something. What presumably happened was the the arbor is actually a bit um, elastic, and it went further than it bent to, and that pushed the wheel over on the collet at the same time. So, not um, not a pretty sight. And of course, the brass part of it, at least, will be getting sort of work hardened. We'll find the high point. It's a bit like straightening pivots, isn't it? You just know that the thing's gonna poor thing's gonna break off any second. So I'm just um, turning the wheel so I can feel where the high point is. Yeah, Derek, I think you're right. Having nearly done it now, I'm just reading the live chat because uh, I think we've maybe lost um, Team Open Clock Club. Uh, great. Um, nice message from Jim. Um, how to repair pendulum clocks has just this minute arrived from the UK to Ottawa. Yay! Thank you, Jim, for buying. Uh, that has um, it keeps the lights on, as they say. So really appreciated. Good luck with that. Have you got a clock, Jim, as well to work on? Have you got an Enfield, or is it just sort of more general? Interest. Yeah. 
So you can see, um, if you look at this end up here, when I turn the arbor, so we're trying to find that high point, which is about there. And Ooh, not bad. Just, so that's with the arbor turning. And you can see the, just get a, maybe difficult to see with the parallax. about a millimetre and a half. That's even better. So within a millimetre at 180 mil, and the centre is at uh, nearly 50 mil, so 5, 10, 15, 18, so that's 3 and 3.7 times more, is it? So it's whatever a millimetre divided by 3.7 is. So um, I'm going to call that it for that operation now. Happy with that. But of course, what it's done is it hasn't straightened up the wheel on its collet. But that's OK. Uh, we can deal with that in a separate operation, I think. Um, I'm going to yeah, can you see that? Just a little bit of a wobble. Probably. It's always tempting to do more, isn't it? This is where it goes terribly wrong. Um, good old drumsticks. Yeah, it's really difficult to even sort of feel the high point now. Beautiful evening. I was going to pull the blind down. Crazy, isn't it? It started um, when it was uh, dark. It's using a, a square. Don't think it's particularly getting any better. It just seems to be going from kind of one side to the other. No, it's getting worse. Okay, I'm going to call that a day now. Almost impossible to leave it alone. Yeah, having this. Um, extension really helps ampli amplifying the um the the error right okay really will stop messing about now so i'll end up end up breaking it okay so i'm just now to think how to straighten this wheel a bit again uh, of course the question is is it a problem um, we've got our friction spring 
on the back there. That's fine. That's the spring. It's going to move in and out. Although uh, it probably will mean that when, as you move the hand round, um, the friction changes, which is a little bit disconcerting for the uh, sort of user. Um, and the other thing, of course, is how is it going to mesh with the uh, minute wheel here? And uh, that's not going to be a problem, I wouldn't have thought, because as much as it looks quite bad in this plane, the radius, change of radius is uh, is tiny. Um, so let's just have a go at um, um, doing something with it. Very exciting that the books got to uh, Canada. Can't tell you how uh, delighted I am. Right, so I've got here, ooh, that's um nice look, nearly, nearly fits perfectly. So I've got a brass, brass, boxwood um, split stick that I made. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drill, in fact, maybe I don't even need to drill it. Put that in there. Um, so it's resting on this, uh, the shoulder of this collet here. Then again, just rotating it, finding the high spot, tap it down with the boxwood hammer. So all I need to do is to relieve this end here. I think the other side's already broken off. Um, that one, isn't it? Yeah, that's uh, snapped off anyway. So there's loads of room on that one. But on this one, just going to have to uh, relieve it a bit. I could drill it out, but I'm just going to file it. Still haven't gotten round to labeling those file drawers yet, so I need to constantly look at which is which. Injury. A bit more. Oh, let's just look at how that looks. So that's good. You can just see there, it's it's the, the diameter of the hole drilled in the box, what is slightly smaller than the pipe. So it's going to grip it nice and tightly. And, um, and I can see I also stamped this in the days when I, and put my name on it, I met a brand on it as well. So what we're going to do is just, find the high spot and then uh, tap it down here. So excuse all the mess. Let's just move across to the vice. Clock parts everywhere. See that. Another tool still not unpacked from uh, being out on the road. Boxwood mallet with an ash handle. I think we talked about this before. I got it from Lee Side Tools um, down near Chichester. So let's just uh, identify that high spot. Oh, Richard, do you see? Um, Simon Cohn's mm. Facebook. No. Oh, that's nice. Jim uh, is in Ottawa and his psychopath engine stopped just this minute around. Yeah, we've been talking about it. How cool is that?
Okay, let's uh, try that. It's better, again, maybe I can fiddle with it later, but it's a lot straighter than it was. Just have a... better when you can see so really cool tool this um if you can't get hold of boxwood well boxwood's quite easy to get you can buy it for uh like turning supplies and as you can see this is one of those tools like all tools and everything i know uh that just gets used up it gets used and it gets used up so a bit like the old um drumstick thing which is now onto its third life uh these this is really cool. I can't even remember. I think that was an hour pipe for a long case clock, I think. Um, something like that, probably. Anyway, uh, there you go. Let's just... That's what I don't want to do here is to knock it off its collet. Um, when I was when I had it in the boxwood split stick thing, of course it was fine because it was kind of more compressing the joint. I don't really want to knock it much in this direction because I think it's going to. Um, yeah, it's still a, a little bit wobbly, but I think we'll see how that goes because the end is still quite a long way off. Uh, doing it at this good old pace, maybe a little bit. I'm so tempted just to carry on until I do that, but I know what will happen. I'll end up snapping it off and then I'll be tears. Hmm. No, it seems to have reached a, <laughs> it seems to reach a place where you bend it one way and it's too far the other way. All right, stop doing that. Right, so, uh, good. So quite happy with that. I think that'll be fine. But we'll we'll see what we can do when we put the hand on the clock. If we've got to make some hands yet, remember, so some amount of time away. Oh, remember, I always say this every week, but for new people here, uh, thank you for turning up. Don't wear gloves when doing this, but it's only because of moving the camera, turning the camera on and off and changing the focus and things like that. Normally, I'd wear gloves the whole time, and there's a video about it on my other YouTube channel. Good. So that's that done. So I've got two things now to tackle, and it's quarter past seven. Um, one, maybe we'll just do this for a bit of fun after all that high tension. Uh, and then next week we can tackle uh, repivoting this wheel, which needs to be done. But I know that um, the uh, jury said that they wanted to see this um, rack spring, uh, something happen to it, quite what, I don't know. Um, so let's have a look what it's like underneath. Get those pins out. So let me just remind myself what we're aiming to do here. Um, again, uh, without banging on, but for new people, uh, normally you would say, is this safe? Yes, is the answer, although it looks uh, inexpert, one might say. Um, it is kind of does its job. It's not actually 
actually it's a lot better than a lot of rack springs I see because a lot of rack springs that have been replaced are those ones that you buy from the kind of wholesaler or whatever they're called material house and they're really really strong and short and strong so they bang you know the rack back it goes with enormous clunk which eventually breaks the rivet between the rack and the rack um so this actually is quite squidgy quite springy and uh, not squidgy and uh it's doing its job so we're going to end up with something that feels like this but um to a lot of people looks a little bit neater so um soft solder we're going to get that off i mean presumably this was heated in the first place obviously it was heated in the first place but presumably it was heated with the gas torch to uh make that repair you can see it's not been that hot because the solder hasn't run properly and on the inside i think we identified there that the screw has broken off so let's just I'll have a look at that because it might be that if it was riveted, we can just punch it out from the back and we don't have to heat it up. But hmm. we'll try that. I'm I'm sure it's a screw that's broken off, though. Uh, I don't think it's going to respond to punching out but let's have a little try okay let's find something to support it on. Um, Brush handles that are pretty much the same height. Get, get it as close to the... Um, now you might say, well, why don't you just cut the spring off? I could do, but I want to try and keep as much of it as possible. No, it's, it's a screw and it's just damaging the brass around it. So I to stop doing that and start doing something else. So it's up to um, heating it. So let's just clear a little space. So when you want to remove soft solder like this, I don't personally have a problem with soft solder. It's uh, really, really useful. If it's done neatly, it can be a really good repair for many things, certainly for brasses often a lot better than brazing or silver soldering because of course that's going to anneal the material if you soft solder and you control the temperature then you can uh, prevent it from um, uh, making everything soft so let's just get board don't really want to scratch this too much on here um but i can't really think of anything to put underneath 
I don't have any sort of fiberglass or anything that's going to stop it from scratching. And um, here's one I prepared earlier, my Glasgow brush. So the beauty of soaking the brush first is when you put the gas on and you're brushing away the solder, because we only want to raise the temperature enough to melt the solder. We don't want to go at it crazy. Not a great fan of sort of heating the thing up. I suppose we could try and protect this from heating, but to be honest, I doubt whether the person who did this repair did that. So we're not going to be heating uh, higher than it's been heated already. So again, a little bit of what's done is done. Um, Jeremy says, indeed, get rid of the hollowed rack spring as soon as possible. <laughs> it's going, Jeremy, don't worry, it's going, it's going. Any minute now, I'm gonna melt my camera, uh, set the fire alarms off and uh, get rid of the rack spring. So all good, it's gonna actually, uh, let's get the extractor on a bit. And check it's plugged in. Right, so we've got a bit of a extraction going on here, so that's going to get in the way, but help. And um, so Jeremy's not learned to love the rack spring yet. You will eventually. Might just got to keep working on you. That's, uh... Good, so there we go. Uh, no major drama. And um, so just, uh, that wasn't exactly heating gently. If it was a small, smaller component, I might use the spirit lamp, but so I would just raise the temperature, used our um, water soap brush, which you can see has still got a bit singed, but it certainly um, saved it a bit. And also, of course, with this, just don't have plastic bristle brushes in the workshop. It's life's too short. Um, get rid of them. Right, so here we are. So you know what the next question is, how much of this rack spring foot? Because it's actually really nice. And if you can see that, it's probably the original spring foot, get it in focus. And it's got the end curled round and going through the steady pin hole here. So the screw, presumably somebody's tightened the screw, the screw head's broken off. And uh, it's um, it's stuck in the plate, so I'm going to rescue that somehow. I'm going to, have to drill out that screw, which will be tricky. Let's just have a little closer look. Normally, uh, in this process, we would take more photographs, but can't really break off and uh, do that here. Right. I'll take a photograph and put it on the Facebook page because it's really, if you can see, let's just have a, see how close we can get here. It's really nice. Um, I'm so pleased I haven't just gotten rid of it altogether. So yeah, it's quite an unusual shape like this, uh, curved round here. Um, normally they're kind of more teardrop shaped as you probably know. And you can see where it's been one piece, the end is broken off here and um, oh, it's loose, the end's broken off. 
and uh, he used to come down here at Uktar Rak. So uh, thinking ahead to next week, because we've been at it an hour and a half now, just one of those days where actually clock repairing doesn't actually seem too bad. Um, <laughs> they, uh, I think it's a relief of not working on the, you know what, they're working on earlier this week where it was slightly kind of like uh, higher stakes. Um, the question is then, how are we going to keep this foot? Normally what you can do, sometimes you can drill into the side of the material and put a bit of wire in there, but I think it's going to be too thin for me to be able to do that. So maybe dovetail a piece in. So start with a thicker piece of round brass wire, file it to a taper, file the end square, and then uh, cut it with a piercing saw and dovetail a piece in. Um, or we could do what the person before did and actually keep this as it is, which are really is really nice, and make our new rack spring, just like the old, like that one that we've just taken off, but do a kind of neat job of it and actually lay it on top. And of course, everybody who comes along in future will go, what? what's that all about? Um, so that's something to think about for next week. Uh, let's just have a look. Um, so can Alan will dissolve the steel screw. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, we can we could uh, rust or dissolve that screw out. Uh, thank you, Derek. Um, so, yeah, once we've got the screw out, are we going to um, dovetail here? Oh, it's quite close to the edge. So that might be a little bit tricky. Or we could really neatly, I, I, I was joke, sort of half joking, but if we've got a big enough piece of wire, annealed the end, flattened it down, we could actually lay a piece on there that looks kind of quite smart. And then, yeah, we're soldering to it again with soft solder, but it's it'll be neater than this, even by my standards. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of quite tempted with that, but again, let me know what you think. I wonder whether because it's loose, we can actually unscrew it. Because of course this is soft, we can um, we can bend it back. Don't want to scratch the plate. It's probably been riveted on, I think. Yeah, it's not coming unscrewed. So Derek's suggestion of uh, rusting it out is a nice idea. That's just um, making a mark on the plate. It's not actually doing anything. So, yeah, cool. Okay, well, we might leave it there this week. It's been um, really exciting and we've got a nice little project for next week. And I'll think about how I'm going to hold work hold for doing the repivoting of the centre wheel as well. So um, we don't know about this mark here. Maybe if we have a closer look, we can kind of get some more evidence. As a principle for this, I always make the rack spring as long as possible tapered as I've said many times so it's got that nice sort of almost lazy action what you don't want with this is something that's really quite percussive because it'll just cause uh, cause damage so obviously the longest we can go is down to the bottom of the frame we don't want it although sometimes you do see them where they actually touch the seat board uh, but don't maybe want to go there but anyway so I my proposal is um, to do it so this is our spring. It's actually not that shape at all, is it? This is our spring. It's this kind of shape. Uh, and the screw is there. So my proposal would be to make a new spring that is shaped and just lays on there like that. So a little there, and then this will come off here and go down and like that on the end. So, um, oh, we could try sewing it, but I think it's too close to the edge to dovetail it. Um, our other idea is glue it, make a completely new one. Uh, we've got a sheet of CZ108 somewhere arrived in the post last week. Um, so we could do that as well, but then what do you do with this, uh, this existing one, which gave me an idea, which will probably be, again, something else for you to think about for next week. As you probably gather, Team Welcome Clock Club has disappeared now. Um, oh, there we are. She's gone. So um, that's some commitment to you, for you, isn't it? Uh, is that...
When we rivet on our new spring, like this, because we've got those, uh, well, we're gonna make steel rivets, can't even see where it goes now, it goes there. Um, because we've got steel rivets, what about putting the old spring on top, not in any kind of active way, but just to uh, keep it there. Our new one's a bit thicker, a bit wider anyway. Um, so we might wanna thin it down a bit. I was just thinking before that would help like that. Um, still want thinning down a little bit at this end, but uh, could kind of just put that there as well uh, as a sort of experiment. And then we'd have to worry about losing it. Just an idea. Anyway, thanks very much um, for everybody for <laughs> bearing with me. As always, thank you to uh, Team Open Clock Club who've gone now already. And uh, I thank you particularly uh, for buying the book. Brilliant, well done. They, they keep sort of trundling out the door, which is, which is always nice when they sell. And um, so remember, if you're in the market for some other dynamic object uh, talks, that was sort of short talks given by those curator conservators, those uh, then uh, Icon Institute of Conservation, 10th of May, six o'clock, it's a Monday, please sign up for that. Otherwise, I hope to see you on Facebook. I'll put a picture of this stuff on there we've been doing tonight. And um, then on Saturday, which isn't far away, is it? We will be back here at six o'clock for another um, Open Clock Club. And I think we're still putting together our single train Enfield. We didn't quite manage that last week either. So these things take a long time. But well, there you go. Hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for your support and um, uh, have a nice time and we'll see you at the weekend. I'll be well. Okay. Oh, where's my mouse?